Well, it really is a pleasure to be here to share the Word of God with you. And I'd like you to stand as we read some scripture. So we stand in reverence of the Word. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 17 to 25, 28 to 37, and John chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. Jesus is led away to be crucified. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and the two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Jesus dies on a cross. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was a preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Jesus rises from the tomb. Chapter 20. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths laying there, Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths laying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not laying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes." Brothers and sisters, he is risen. Amen. Amen. After a scripture like that, I think that the only thing that we could really do is go back into worship. So let's worship with one more song as we honor him and we thank him for what he's done. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. 
with visuals like that, it really helps us to understand a little bit more of what he did for us. Amen? Amen. And we worship him. The message today is titled, Tetelestai. Can anyone tell me what Tetelestai means? Anybody? Tetelestai. Tetelestai. It's the Greek for it is finished. It is finished. So this message is partly based on the current men's Bible study where we're actually studying victory and spiritual warfare by Dr. Tony Evans. And we'll continue to read and share and refer to many more scripture passages as we rely upon his word to discover certain truths of our faith. In John 19:30, we read previously, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This makes, a, makes us ask the question, what was finished? What was finished? In the Greek, it is finished, it's translated to telestai. It is a Koine Greek word. Koine is common Greek spoken by most people at the time. If we have any Greek scholars in the house tonight, please forgive my Greek accent. And as we forgave Irma for her Greek accent too. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody say, Tetelestai. 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 It is finished. We translate this one Greek word into three English words. It is finished. It signifies, in the Greek, the completion of a transaction. A transaction paid in full. An agreement fully completed. Something was completed. It signifies a happy, victorious word, a word of achievement. Somebody's happy. Paul also used this word in 2 Timothy 4, 7, when he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He used it as a word of victory, a word of achievement. So what was finished? Note Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. That's so Jesus was only just starting. So four points come out of the statement, it is finished. The first point, the cross addresses the problem of sin. It has to do with the debt incurred by sin. Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Matthew 6.12 tells us, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is a debt that just will not go away. We seem to have been paying this debt forever. Something like the credit card that some, debt that some of us have. Yeah? It just seems to never want to go away. In fact, we keep adding to the credit card debt by buying more and more, instead of decreasing the, the debt. We might even max out the credit card and we keep it going by making a partial payment, sometimes just a minimal payment that's required by the credit card company. The higher the credit limit, the deeper we can get into credit card debt. And then we find that we're in a pit from which it is difficult to climb out of. But there's good news though. It is possible to pay off our credit card debt one day. We could do it. But the bad news is, it's impossible for us to pay off the debt caused by sin. We can't do it. So sin is a debt incurred by man that we cannot pay. The one who we owe is perfect. We cannot make payments for, for us to become perfect. No one else on this earth can pay for us to get into heaven. A rich grandfather can do it. A sugar daddy can't do it. 
Nobody. It's just impossible. We cannot pay our way back into perfection. Adam and Eve really messed it up for us. Yeah? Yep. Adam and Eve were created both physically and spiritually alive. But because they sinned, we are now born physically alive, but spiritually dead. So it all started with Eve and the serpent. She believed a lie. She was deceived. So let's go to where it all began in Genesis 3, reading from the complete Jewish Bible version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal which Adonai, God, had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you are not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You are neither to eat from it nor touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, It is not true that you will surely die, because God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. They heard the voice of Adonai God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Adonai God among the trees in the garden. Adonai called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I ordered you not to eat? The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Adonai God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman answered, The serpent tricked me, so I ate. Believing a lie invites demons, as Adam and Eve found out. When tempted by Satan, Eve did not even think for a while or say to the devil, Let me sleep on it. She responded pretty much immediately. You realize that? And the devil deceived Eve. Did God really say? Eve fell, then Adam fell, and Adam fell as well. So sin caused the fall of man and created separation between man and God. That separation caused by sin is a debt owed. The devil is still asking the question, did God really say? But who is he asking this question to? Not to Adam and Eve anymore. He is continually bombarding this, us with this question to you and to me. He continues to do his best to deceive us. He is the father of lies. He continually harasses us with his lies. Have you ever been deceived by the father of lies and responded to him immediately? Maybe even in the, full, or even in the fullness of time? We ask God to search our hearts to, to discover any wicked ways that we've developed because we have listened to the wrong voice. Do you believe any of his lies? Lies like, God does not love me. I will never get over this addiction. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not saved. I can never have any peace or joy in this life. I'm good for nothing. Today, if we were ever to see a serpent, I think that most of us would run. Yes? But when the serpent tempted Eve with his crafty words, she would have quickly reasoned to herself, Oh, he's, he's such a nice serpent. He's so cute. And he's encouraging me with so much truth. I think that I'll try the fruit. It looks good to eat. He's really convincing. I believe and trust him. I think that I will like to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because it will make me wise. She thought, 
I think I could trust this serpent even though he's telling me a different truth to what God has told me. So she listened to the serpent and took it even further with another thought. Let me share the serpent's good news. I think that I will share my newfound pleasure in life with Adam. Adam, where are you? Adam, look at this fruit. It is so ripe and juicy. Would you like to take a bite? Taste and see how good it is. After this act of disobedience to God, they were no longer spiritually alive, but became spiritually dead. Who remembers Flip Wilson from TV? Yeah? yeah? Flip, Wilson. Flip Wilson from TV in the 70s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talking to the wrong audience. <laughs> Flip Wilson was a comedian on TV. And he... Um, his, his catchphrase was, the devil made me do it. Yes. So there was a skit, for example, where his wife at the time was, just came into the house and said, look at what I just got. And he said, another dress? That's about the 30th dress for the week that you bought. And her answer was, the devil made me do it. <laughs> but of course... We know that the devil doesn't make us do it. He puts a thought in our heads. We're the ones who answer, yes or no. The devil doesn't make us do it. The devil doesn't have that control over us. He can't make us do anything that we don't want to do. We have to take ownership for what we do. The devil, the devil loves it when he hears us saying, I think. Because what he's really hearing us say is, I stink, <laughs> not think, because I'm about to sin through disobedience, through rebellion, through wanting to do it my own way, through not taking into account what God has said is right or wrong, through listening to the enemy, through not trusting God for the answer through leaning on our own understanding. So I think leads to I stink, which leads to stinking thinking. <laughs> yeah. Do you suffer from stinking thinking? We have to ask ourselves. Some of us, maybe even all of us, to some degree do suffer from stinking thinking. And we may be aware and we may not be aware of our condition. May the Lord bring repentance to us quickly. May he give us a way out, and may he take, and may we take that way out eagerly. May we love him so much that we want to honor him by being obedient to his words. May we also have always the right motive. I think makes us come to conclusions based upon our own faulty, deficient understanding. When we go into I think mode, it takes us away from the protection of God. It takes us away from his covering because we're not allowing him to speak to us, and so we're not really responding to him. We're not even hearing him. It's me before him. That's thinking, thinking. We're thinking instead of listening. We have got to learn the difference between God's voice, the enemy's voice, and our own voice when we're dealing with situations in our lives. How experienced are we at discerning the voices? How sure are we that because we discerned correctly last time, so that the next time, we are going to get it right? We make an assumption. We got it right once, we'll get it, always get it right. Can't, it doesn't work that way. Is there wisdom in the multitude of counselors? Or do I decide a matter based solely upon my own impression from what I think God is saying? We cannot trust ourselves. 
Now, going back to the fact that we cannot pay this debt that we have because of sin, some people do believe that we can actually get through by good works. They believe that by doing enough good works, enough religion, enough going to church on a Sunday or Saturday as it is today, enough being good enough, doing our best, enough rituals, enough of doing this or that, that this will get us out of debt and get us into heaven. They believe that God will understand and will say at judgment time, he's nice, so let him in. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Some think, I'm a good person. I go to church every Sunday. I have not murdered anybody. I do not steal. I do not lie. My friends love me, and they think that I'm a nice person. I help the poor. I am a nice person. So God must let me into heaven. And I'm sure that you've heard people say things like this before, about themselves and about other people. But this is not so. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. What is righteousness? All those good attributes and things do not make us righteous with God. In fact, if we have not accepted Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, no matter how good we are, no matter how nice we are, no matter how much we love by others, we're still under the wrath of God. And we won't make it. It is not good enough to be good enough. It is not good enough to be good enough. So something had to address the debt of sin incurred by man. What was Jesus referring to when he said, it is finished? He was referring to debt incurred since Adam and Eve's time. Lambs and bulls have been slain at the altar in Old Testament times. Sacrifices made, sacrifices given. The law could still not justify us. If you broke one law, then you've broken all of the law. Sin is a debt that we cannot ourselves pay, whether we were in the Old Testament time or in this present age. We can't do it ourselves. If we all took a challenge to swim from Trinidad to New York, and we all gathered in Maracas, what do you think would happen? We would wonder who would make it first to New York. <laughs> as we set off, as we all set off, we'll see that very quickly many will drop out and turn back. Some are even wrong. Yeah. Then we find that some others have managed to get a little bit further along, but then they start to find difficulty. Some might turn back again if it's not too late or they drown. Then others, the remnant, will get even further along. And what happens to them? They can't make it. They drown eventually. They perish because there was no help. Does anyone here think that you could successfully swim from Trinidad to New York without help? No. Just as it is impossible to achieve the goal of swimming and surviving with no help from Trinidad to New York, because it is too far and we perish. It is too far for us to get to earth, from earth to heaven on our own. So we need help because we perish while trying in vain. Being nice and being close because we nearly got to New York does not pay the debt. Being nice and just doing things to try through works to get to heaven will not get us there. The cross at its core is that the issue of sin was addressed by the death of Christ. God's wrath was poured out on him. Jesus paid the ultimate price for sin when he willingly laid down his life for the sin debt. In Luke 23:46, we read, 
And Jesus, crying out in a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. We note that Jesus' life was not taken away from him. He handed it over voluntarily to the Father. Jesus paid the ultimate price for sin when he willingly laid down his life for the sin debt. Some people say that they hate the Jews because the Jews are the ones who crucified Jesus, and they blame the Jews. Some people blame the Romans for the crucifixion and death of Jesus. But it wasn't, that's not the case. Jesus was crucified because of us, because of me and you, because of our sin. It's not the Jews and it's not the Romans. God had a master plan from the beginning. He had a way to bring man back into righteousness. We could not pay the price, but God could. The following scriptures show us his unfolding master plan of issues of Jesus coming to the earth to save us. In the Old Testament, we read in Genesis 3.15, I will put animosity be between you and the woman and between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Concerning Jesus' ministry and death, Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Psalm 22, 16-18, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. The clearest prophecy about Jesus is the entire 53rd chapter of Isaiah, part of which in verses 3 to 7 says, He, he was despised, despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was cruised, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 56, 50 verse 6 accurately describes the beating that Jesus endured. Zechariah, again, 12, chapter 12, verse 12, predicts the piercing of the Messiah, which occurred after Jesus died on the cross. The Old Testament most defin definitely prophesies the coming of Jesus as a Messiah. We see in the New Testament the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' death and resurrection and the beginning of a new covenant. 1 Peter 1, verses 17 to 21 says, And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's read verse 26 again. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. This shows us God's master plan. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Romans 6.10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. This tells us that the work of atonement is unrepeatable. It's once and for all. Romans 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the first point tells us that the cross addresses the problem of sin. 
The second point is, what was the payment? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross for us? Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. Man owns the debt. We cannot pay it. Only God can pay it. However, if the wages of sin is death, God is a spirit and can't die. So how can he die? Through the incarnation, he became a man. God became a man. Jesus was born fully man and fully God. Remember the wages of sin is death. God as a spirit cannot die. But as a man through Jesus, he can die and pay the penalty for us. The payment of our death, our debt, D-E-B-T, the payment of our debt was the death of Jesus, D-E-A-T-H. On the cross, God took the penalty so that he could love the sinner, pay for the sin, satisfy his wrath, and express love without compromising his nature or his perfection. When Jesus died on the cross, he himself had no debt to pay, but he took on all our sin, all our sin debt onto himself. Said another way, if the penalty of death, sin is death and we have all sinned, therefore we will all die and we cannot make the payment for sin, and the only one who could afford to pay the debt is God, but God is a spirit and cannot die, then how can this debt be paid? Simple. God must become a man and die. So God said, I will pay the debt. The payment of sin is death. God took the penalty, died on the cross, and paid our debt in full. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The cross did a second thing for us. Jesus not only took our spiritual death un unto himself, but also God gave us Jesus' righteousness and credited it to our account. We are no longer in debt, and now we have Jesus' righteousness deposited into our spirit. Jesus lived 33 perfect years on the earth. God deposited into us his perfection and righteousness into our spirit when we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Righteousness pleases God. Wrongness is the opposite of righteousness. Wrongness does not please God. In our Bible study, we came up with a new word, courtesy Larry, when we spoke about righteousness and wrong being the opposite we came up with the word wrongciousness. <laughs> <laughs> wrongciousness does not please God. Our spirits have been regenerated. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides in our spirit. The debt of Jesus is the only form of payment God accepts. There is no salvation by any other name other than the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Acts 4.12 tells us, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All other gods are false gods. There are not many ways to heaven, as some would believe. Rather, there is only one way to heaven. The third point is, what is the proof of payment? When you go out to a restaurant and time comes to pay the bill and you hand over your credit card, you may swipe it or these days you would insert it <laughs> into the machine and you're given a receipt. And this receipt is proof of payment. So that if you're going through the door of the restaurant and leaving, the manager isn't going to come to you and say, oh, you haven't paid because you'll be able to pull out your receipt and show proof that you have paid. Proof of payment is in the resurrection. Paul says, if the resurrection is not true, then we're all still in our sin. The cross without the resurrection is a waste of time. 1 Corinthians 15, 7, 17 says, 
And if Christ has not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But thank God that's not true. Christ has risen, and our faith is not futile, and we are not still in our sins. Amen. Amen. We had a movie night some time ago when we showed the case for Christ. Who remembers that? Yeah. All right. It was about a journalist, an unbeliever, a skeptic who decided to do research to prove his wife's newfound faith in Jesus to be false. He wanted to save his wife from this newly found relationship with a false god, what he thought was a false god. He expected his research to prove himself right, but this was not the case. He found so many historical facts that he could only conclude that the resurrection to be true. Lee Strobel, one fateful day, after so many trying times in their relationship, because there was so much conflict, he came to his wife and said, after much research and much soul searching, I believe. I believe. So to this day, he's a staunch believer in the finished work of the cross and a true believer of Christ as he continues to make the case for Christ in his everyday life. Just in case we may have some skeptics in the house, any unbelievers, anyone in unbelief, I would like to play a short clip of Lee Strobel making a presentation where he shows how the resurrection presents a solid case for Christ, the resurrected Messiah. No room for doubt. The scripture tells us about Doubting Thomas. Today when we think of him, we still think of him and describe him as Doubting Thomas. But I believe that this is erroneous. A more accurate description of him would be Thomas who once doubted but now believes. Thomas is a believer, not a doubter. So we pray that in this congregation that there be no doubt, no unbelief. Today, right now, we rebuke any spirit of unbelief in this congregation in God's house. Instead, we speak the full knowledge of God and faith in Jesus' finished work of the cross by which we're made whole, by which we're saved. He has redeemed us and now we are spiritually alive in Him. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for unbelief. A dead Savior cannot save anyone. We serve the one and only true living God. We know the truth, and when we accept the truth, the truth will set us free. We're freed from God's wrath. We become a child of God. We're made righteous through Jesus' death and resurrection. Going back again. We know the truth. And when we accept the truth, the truth will set us free. Because there's a lot of people outside there who know the truth, but they reject it. And so they've not been set free. So God gives us the truth, but we have to accept it. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. We said that before. Romans 6.10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. We said again that that work of atonement is unrepeatable. He cannot die a second time for us. He cannot be separated from the Father again. It's a finished work. Romans 10, 4, again. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Do you know that even the other disciples doubted? In John 20, verses 1 to 8, we read, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've taken him. And then we had heard before, but we've been bringing it up again. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb, so they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. 
And he's stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths laying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. So even the other disciples didn't believe. They didn't know what to believe. But we have a bigger picture after the fact. God has given us his word, and we believe through faith. The resurrection is a receipt, the proof of payment. The fourth point is another question. So what do we do with this now? Romans 10, 9, 13 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are a three-part being. We are body, soul, and spirit. There are typically three types of people in church, maybe even in this church right now. First type of person would be that have a message like this or a message like what Reverend Michel would be preaching or some other message that they hear. It hits the air, it hits the body, and it hits the air, and it drops off. So by the time we go downstairs for fellowship, or by the time we get to the car to go home, we've forgotten the message. We just had a kind of okay time when we were in church. The second kind of person is where the message gets a little bit deeper. It goes through the air, and it gets into our soul. Then we respond to the message, but in a confused, soulish way, and we're not truly at peace. We're not experiencing the joy of the Lord. We live in a sin-confessed cycle that we just seem not to be able to control. In fact, the sin-confessed cycle controls us. We may not have understood the message we heard. In fact, we may have even misunderstood the message that we heard. The devil may be whispering in our ears, did God really say? So we're in turmoil, we're in conflict. The third kind of person who would be here is a message goes through the air, goes through the soul, deep into the spirit. And the message goes deep. And God turns on the tap in our spirit where true change begins. It now overflows back into our soul, which now brings about transformation. It changes how we walk, how we talk. It changes everything. We're now at peace. We now experience joy. Bondages are broken. We're set free. We receive deliverance. While preparing to come to, to church this afternoon, I had Inspiration Channel on, and I heard a testimony of a Palestinian. And this gentleman was saying that growing up as a Palestinian, you're taught to hate the Jews, you're taught to hate the West, all you're taught really is hate. But he had an encounter, and he had a Bible. And he started to read the Bible. Now, backing up a little bit, he got married, and his marriage was always in conflict. From the time they got married, he would always abuse the wife, and he would always quarrel, and he'd always be angry, and the wife wasn't enjoying it. But he was downstairs one day, reading the Bible. God touched him. And he accepted the Lord that, that night 
as his personal Lord and Savior. He came to the truth, to the knowledge of the truth. When he went upstairs, the wife was expecting him to quarrel and to fight. And so she said, turn the light off. And she turned the light off, and he said, no, turn the light back on. So he turned the light on, and she's expecting the worst. And he says to her, I've had an experience. I believe. I believe in God, Jesus. And she said, uh, okay, let's go to sleep. Turn the lights off and you'll be okay tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> so she turned the lights off and he turned it back on. He said, no, I believe. And then she said, okay. So what happened, he's saying, is that after about a month of this, the wife turns to him once and says, what have you done with my husband? Where is he? And he said to her, I got rid of him. <laughs> and then he said, would you like back your old husband? And she said, no, I prefer the new one. <laughs> So, when we get the message deep in our spirit, it changes how we walk, it changes how we talk, it changes everything. And this is testimonies that, it's not just words, it's happening. Unattended trash in our house invites roaches. I see a couple of the men nodding their heads because this is part of the Bible study. They in turn invite each other and they have a party because of this unattended trash. We cannot pray away the roaches without dealing with the trash. We cannot say, in the name of Jesus, roaches be gone. They won't listen because the trash is still there. So we have to deal with the trash in order to get rid of the roaches. Unattended sin in our lives attract demons. You could call them cockroaches too. <laughs> they invite one another in. So when one is cast out, they invite seven more into the space if it's not quickly filled by the Holy Spirit. So do you have unattended sin in your life? If so, then expect to be harassed by the demons. If you don't want to be harassed by the demons, then we have to do something about the unattended sin in our life. Amen? Amen. So what then is the end result after? Once we attend to the unattended sin, we experience peace, joy, contentment, can I even say happiness in the Lord? We have everything we need stored up in the heavenlies. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So we must run to the heavenly places for answers. Pray and keep praying. Proven prayer, singing psalms, and spiritual songs. We put on the belt of truth, which is God's truth, not our truth, which leads to righteousness and leads to the peace of the gospel. Now, if I told you that I'd been to your home and dug up in your backyard and put a million dollars, buried it in your backyard, and it's there waiting for you. Right after service, you're not going to stay for no koinonia dinner. <laughs> you're not going to say, you know, how are your sister, how are your brother? You're just gone in your car to your home, get your shovel, and start digging in your church clothes, 
And then you might even think, well, okay, this is keeping it back, so you go and put on some old clothes and you keep on digging. And you're digging deep, because you don't know how deep it is. You're digging deep into your backyard to find this million dollars that's been deposited in your back, backyard. Because after all, it's worth digging deep, yes? It's a million dollars, right? So you're going to dig deep when it comes to God. Because dig, by digging deep to know the truths of God, to find the peace and the joy and the contentment, to answer God's call for our life, is worth much more than a million dollars. So if we could go and dig deep for a million dollars, we could dig even deeper for God's truth and God's love. So we, how do we dig deep? We dig deep by reading the Word of God, by meditating on the Word of God, by pondering on the Word of God, by praying, by crying out to God over and over again, by repenting, by obeying the two greatest commandments, and we all know what the two greatest commandments are, by being discipled and spending time corporately like this in his presence. Digging deep makes, it, makes the word go from hearing, then it drives it down into our spirit, into our soul, then into our spirit. You drive it in, you drive it in, you drive it in by digging deep. Just merely reading a short passage or a short devotional and quickly getting up and telling ourselves, got to go, got to go, lots to do, got to go, things to do. This is not digging um, deep. This will not drive the word into our spirit. If all you do is just read the devotional that I post uh, most days, that's not enough. That's not digging deep. That's a help but it's not the answer. It's part of the answer, a small part of the answer. That's now scratching the surface. But we have to dig deep. Sin is like a ripe Julie mango. Yeah? Sin is like a ripe Julie mango. So we have a Julie mango tree in our backyard. And one mango season, there was this really incredible looking mango. It was really beautiful. And when it was ripe, picked it from the tree, and I thought, it looks so good. What a pleasing appearance. It must be healthy and good for my body. I'm holding it in my hand. It's perfectly ripe. It's a big one. Smell it. And it smells incredible. So if this was your mango, just think of how you're going to enjoy eating this Julie mango. It's deep yellow on the outside, and you know it's going to be firm and juicy on the inside. You just keep looking at the mango in anticipation. Now, we're not in mango season, so I don't have a mango like that on the tree right now. But it would have looked something like this. Mm. Now, having said all those things about the mango, take the image of the mango out of your mind. Can't do it. It's still there, right? Try again. Get rid of the image of that mango from your mind. Still can't do it. We're still thinking of the mango. And we're thinking of the juice dripping down our hands, right? <laughs> Sin is just like a ripe Julie mango. The image is stuck in our mind. No matter what you do, you just can't get the image out of your mind. No matter how much I encourage you to get the image out of your mind, it's just not that easy. Sin is like this. Once you have a habitual sin, it's always before you, enticing you, but entrapping you at the same time, 
and we keep going through a sin, confess, sin, confess cycle. So the only way that you can get rid of the image of the Julie Mango is to replace it with, another, with something else. So now if you think of a cold, refreshing slice of watermelon. <laughs> Reverend Michel loves cherries. Okay, now the image is gone. Yes? Now we think of something else. Yes. It's been, the image of the mango is gone. It's been replaced. Thoughts can become fixated. We must replace that thought habit, that thought pattern that is so captivating with an alternative. However, we do not replace one thought image of sin for another thought image of sin. That's just not right. Instead, we replace it with the thoughts of God's love for us, of his holiness. We take every thought captive. While we're at it, let's go back to the million dollar image. Oh, it's because some of us are stuck with a million dollar image as well. Let's do a million dollar exchange from what we were getting in the backyard. Is this something that should be a focus in our lives? Does God want us to have a million dollars? God does want to bless his people, but much more than that, he wants us to be holy and righteous. He may prosper us financially, and he may not. But this I know, he will prosper us in our souls if we allow him to. He may give us all that we need on this earth, but maybe not in excess. We trust in God's providence. So let's exchange that image the thought image of a million dollars in our backyard and our bank account with a different image, an image of righteousness, an image of God's love for us, an image of his holiness, an image of his peace that he gives us, an image of his joy. Now we have something much more valuable than a million dollars. Amen? We have holiness, righteousness, peace, joy. There's no worry. There's no anxiety. You don't have to worry about, what bank do I put a million dollars in? Maybe I don't trust the bank. Maybe I should put it under my mattress. <laughs> Maybe I should give Tom and Jane, you know, $100. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't know what to do with it. It's brought actually a curse. But God's holiness and righteousness and peace and joy could never be a curse. It's a blessing. God wants to bless us. Matthew 6.33 tells us, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We trust God that he will provide all that we need. All he asks of us is to love him and to be obedient. Sin is a debt that we cannot pay. Money in the bank account will not help. God only accepts the death of Jesus for payment of our sin, and not even our good works count. Our good works only messes things up. Our good works is like trying to spend obviously counterfeit money at a shop, or like trying to spend $20 in the mall in Miami. <laughs> they won't take it. However, God will not credit our account until we declare bankruptcy spiritually, when we know that all hope is lost for liquidating the debt. We must believe that we are a sinner and cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves by keeping the Ten Commandments, going to church, going to Bible study, or prayer meeting. All these things are good but we must accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. God gives us security in his promises. John 10, verses 27 to 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Hebrews 11:6 tells us, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must be convicted that this is true. 
We trust in God and Christ alone for salvation through faith. We must make a commitment to this belief. Works will be a byproduct of us trusting in Christ alone. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19 talks about where we were and where we are now. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. However, there is a judgment for those who fall away, and it's found in Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully after we have received knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This passage is telling us that a believer, if a believer willfully turns his back on his faith and turns his back on the trust of God, then God's wrath will be on him, upon him once more. He will be judged as an unbeliever. These are not my words. These are the words in the Bible. Hebrews. John 3.36 says, he who, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. If you believe, you will be obedient to his word. Are we always obedient to his word? Do we really believe? We dealt with unbelief. So I'm going to assume we all believe. So we all are obedient to his word, or we're striving to be. You must be holy and righteous in all that you do, all that you say, all that you think. Every motive in your life has got to be sincere. Every motive in your life has got to be sincere. So I ask you, saints, let the Lord search our hearts. Dig deep within your soul and spirit. Am I holy and righteous in all my thoughts, words, and actions? Are my relationships right with God? If I'm married, am I faithful to my spouse? Faithful in the marriage covenant? Am I in spiritual adultery? Am I putting idols in my heart and putting them before God? Do I have other relationships that are more important than that of my spouse? We don't have to be physical with another person to be in adultery. Just spending inappropriate time with another person could be spiritual adultery in a marriage. What is my motive in this relationship? Am I in deliberate sin? Do I steal? Do I lie? Am I not trusting God that He will provide? Do I distrust God's delegated authority in my life, i.e. my pastors? Am I accountable? Do I gossip? Do I engage in meaningless but harmful chatter? If we answered yes to ourselves, to any of, of ourselves, to any of these questions, may you diligently seek God and may we ask God to grant us repentance. Under the new covenant, we are free, we are saved, we are made righteous, we are loved. He is pleased. We are no longer objects of God's wrath. But we have to continue and we have to always dig deep within our soul and spirit and ask God to search our hearts. We might be okay today, but is that a guarantee that we'll be okay tomorrow? 
there's no guarantee. We're in a state of progressive sanctification and we rely upon God and God alone. And, and God alone. We can't do this on our, ourselves. So at this point, we're going to go back into worship because I hope that with this short sharing of various scriptures that you feel even more convicted about our walk with the Lord and that we could show honor and give glory and praise to the Lord for what he's done for us. He saved us from death. D-E-B-T and D-E-A-T-H. And so let's stand as we worship the Lord again in song. First Timothy 1, 12 to 16, tells us about the hope of the unbeliever. Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I have obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me, first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Having heard of this wonderful God who loves us, and has given us salvation, given us life. Is there anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? If you do not know him, would you like to give your life to the Lord? Would you like to experience a new life, a life of freedom, a life of no condemnation? Would you like to experience a life of unspeakable peace and joy. The Bible tells us that in this life there will be trouble, but he has overcome the world and he gives us peace and joy no matter what our circumstances are, once we belong to him and trust him. So once again, is there anyone here who does not know the Lord and Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and would like to Give your life to the Lord. Saints, can we pray right now for souls that are present that don't know him before we go on as Reverend Chris is wrapping up, he's doing, he's asking because there are those of us that know Jesus, we've accepted him. And there are some of us that don't recognize that if you go through your life serving a false God, you will wake up in hell. There cannot be one, more than one God, true and living God. And we remember the tomb was empty. We don't have to go into everything that was just preached. We know he's alive. There are those that died for what they believe in. You know one dies for a lie unless they believe they're going as some people commit suicide bombers. They believe they're going to some heaven where there are virgins waiting on them. That's not what the apostles did when they were martyred. They knew the that truth. Jesus had died and he had risen. And they saw the power of the cross while they were on earth. Is there anyone here that does not know Jesus? We are not forcing anything down your throat. We commit to meeting with you and talking to you about who he is. But do not leave here without letting us pray with you. I just want to pause. And if there's anyone, I just want to ask that you would come forward. And we will pray with you. Is there anyone here who would like to have more joy in their life? More peace? More contentment of what God has given us? Hands up, anybody? we're not perfect 
and we're always open to God, to God's love for us, giving us that peace and joy and contentment. And so, as we close, let's stand as Reverend Michel will pray for peace, joy, contentment, the love of God in our lives. The peace and the joy and the, 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 the love of God comes when sin does not block it. When sin blocks it, that love and that joy is blocked. I will tell you if there's a lack of love and joy in your life, it's because there is stuff there that maybe you don't know is there. So I'm going to pray that God reveal it to you because once that's moved out of the way, you see the joy and the love, the fruit will come forth. The fruit of the Holy Spirit will come forth. If it's not there, it's a sign that there's stuff there that's blocking. And I want to say to us, tomorrow is a holiday. We don't do service on a Sunday morning. You can sleep late. We're going to go and have a nice meal together. We can give God this extra time. I know we know we, we know we're over the time. But God is not going to be boxed in. Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we have heard a message that you have sent your own son who was born to die in an awful way. A way where when he was beaten, the hooks on the edge of the whip hooked his flesh and ripped it out. God, we have no comprehension of the suffering that he was born to die suffering like that. He chose. It was not thrust on him. That's why, Lord, you will not thrust yourself on any of us. It is choice. Father, I pray for those who said they need more love and joy in their life. God, what we are saying is that we want less of the sin and more of you. Because you are perfect love and it is only the joy of the Lord that comes from the Lord that is our strength. It is only because of the work of the Spirit of God in us that we can experience that peace. That we can experience all those things, the fruit, Lord, not the Julie Mango, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we ask you to supernaturally grant the repentance of the sin that is blocking and corking us up, O oh God. We are spiritually constipated, O oh God. Father, you are there waiting to pour the joy, to pour the peace, to pour the love. And God, like Adam, we're hiding Oh God, and the sin is ever before us. And Lord, in some cases we don't know, but in many cases we do. But God, because of the pride, Father, we will not cry out and say, I need help. But God, you know, and Father, we ask you to move in each person. God, especially the ones that said they want more joy, they want more peace. God, we've heard a message explaining to us why it is finished. And for that we are grateful no one can come and steal these possessions, the possession of salvation from us except ourselves. We can rob ourselves, oh God, of what you've blessed us with by simply not obeying, not repenting, where fruit will not come forth. So Father, I pray for each one here. God, I thank you. Lord, in spite of us hearing this message over and over, God, Lord, we're still needing that joy and that peace. Father, grant it as you purge of sin. Grant it, Lord, as you draw us into repentance. Lord, as our pastor has said, we will not stop at doing what God has called us to do by reading the word, praying, Father, asking you to take us deeper, not satisfied until that fruit comes forth, Father. So, Father, right now, I thank you, O oh God. I thank you, Father, for those hearts that don't know you. But, God, you're calling them. 
And Lord, you will not break a bruised reed. You know how to call them. Father, I pray as you bless your people tonight, as we are thankful for this word that we have, God, that we know we serve a true and living God. Lord, we don't have to figure it out. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that you would continue to work in each of us. That even as we leave here to do koinonia, which is communion with each other, Father, that we will remember it is because of you that we can be in communion with each other and with you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Father, I ask you to bless each person as a hand back to Pastor Chris in Jesus' mighty name. And Father, we just pray that even though we are now spiritually alive because of the finished cross of the work, that we do not go back to the old man, the ways of the old man as described in Ephesians 4, where it says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, with the front, saints with the front. It's a new walk. And the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened. Don't let your understanding be darkened. Being alienated from the life of God. Don't allow that to happen to you. Because of the ignorance that is in them. Don't be ignorant. We know the schemes of the devil and we know the truth. Because of the blindness of their heart. Don't allow your heart to be blinded. Pray to God that he would give you a heart of flesh in exchange for the heart of stone. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all in cleanliness with greediness. Pray to God that you don't go back to the old man where you give yourself over because you've given up hope or giving up hope and you're on the broad road and not on the narrow road and find yourself in lewdness or working all on cleanliness with greediness. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. Study that. Make sure that you're not going back in the ways of the old man. Father, we just pray that you would empower your people, that you would overwhelm your people with your love, Lord. Yes. To the point where they don't know what to do with all of this love that, that you're pouring out on them, yes, Lord. And Lord, we just praise and thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for the finished cross, uh, finish work of the cross, Lord. We thank you for dying for our sins, for giving us salvation, for bringing, giving us new life, Lord. And we thank you for this time that even after this service, we could go downstairs and fellowship with one another and love one another because you love us and you've commanded us to love one another. Even if we don't like that other person, we still have to love them. And we have to love them with the right motive. We have to love them sincerely, and Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. And we thank you for giving us strength and for allowing that the Spirit to reside in our spirit so that when we dig deep in, in communion with you, Lord, that it brings transformation in our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And the word is, as we close, Colossians 2, 13 to 14. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It is finished. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise him.